Um, right, uh, everybody, I need to tell you something very important before we go on to our next session, which is if you were getting really excited by the TikTok stuff there, tomorrow we have Evan from Movers and Shakers joining us in the conference to take us through the strategy behind the world's largest TikTok campaign. That's tomorrow at 11.10 a.m. PST. So you you do not want to miss that. That was absolute, That's going to be absolutely crucial if you can see TikTok in your future. And yeah, be disruptive and don't play it safe. It's it's crucial. It's so easy to play it safe and we, we really shouldn't. Okay, we are now going to go on straight on to our next session. So coming up, we have Nicole Buckeye, who has been at the cutting edge of game-changing consumer tech since the early 2020s. Now she's focused on helping e-commerce brands just like you guys to improve customer support by using great tools, AI and personalization via the gorgeous platform our marvelous sponsors, Gorgeous. And it is a key channel, such a key channel, um, especially in the beauty sector where consumers have so many questions. So let's get Nicole in here right now, if I can find my mouse. There we go. Here's Nicole. Hi, Hello, hi Nicole. everyone. And hi. Nicole's being joined by two retailers. We've got Emily from Naked Frankie, and we've also got Bunny from Bloom. So, um, so loads of us on here. Um, Nicole, I think I should let you pretty much just take it over, I think. So have you got your slide deck there that you can share? Are we going with slides today? We are. Excellent. I'll just get those up on screen and I'll get those shared for you. Hello, Nicole. No, we have a frozen Nicole. Guys, uh, is my connection no yeah you so let's just um are you able to um shut down your yeah let's get rid of it get rid of the camera and that hopefully will work are you sharing slides nicole can i hear nicole oh can you guys hear you? me can you see me i can hear you i can see you you were breaking up you don't seem to be anymore this is good um i'll okay. keep an i'll keep an eye if we need to lose your video as we as we go through are you sharing slides nicole yes i am gonna be sharing slides and i'm sorry i'm home at Aaron's house they have the worst why i don't think they've upgraded for a couple of years really just trying to and making sure it's off the wi-fi so it's just full experience going on on my end. it's um it's breaking but, up a oh. lot so if we could lose your video feed I hope we can make it work. So, um, Nicole, you're breaking up a lot. So, if we could lose your video feed. Okay, yeah, I'm going to connect to a hotspot. Give me one minute. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> In which case, whilst Nicole's doing that, um, Emily, do you want to just tell us a little bit about, about your business whilst we're waiting for Nicole to, to get her tech working? Yeah, of course. Hi, everybody. I'm Emily, a co-founder and CMO of Naked Frankie. Um, Naked Frankie is a refill delivery service for Bath and Body Essentials based out of Los Angeles. Um, if you're unfamiliar with refill model, it's basically allowing our customers to reduce plastic packaging waste um, by returning their finished bottles back to us, which will be sanitized and reused again for future orders. Very cool. And um, Bonnie, would you like to let us know a bit more about you and your business too, please? Yeah, totally. Um, good morning. My name is Bunny. I'm one of the co-founders of Bloom. So we're a direct-to-consumer skincare, self-care, and body care startup that really helps girls own their natural ba bravery um, through empowering products and education. Um, so we're based in Vancouver. We primarily sell online through our own website, but you can also find us at Sephora um, in Canada and Urban Outfitters. Um, yeah. Excellent. And uh have you found, Bonnie, that, that selling through multiple channels, so the wholesale route as well as your own website, has that been a joy or was it a tough? To, how did you come to start doing it that way, I guess? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think, you know, there's lots of pros and cons on both sides. I think, you know, obviously when you are a direct to consumer startup and you really own 100% of that relationship, you know, you know, every single customer that's ever purchased from you. And to an extent, you can 
you know, do your best to get into contact with them and learn more about their experience. Or even know, you know, if they repurchased, if they, um, in some cases, how much time they spent on the site, in some cases, um, you know, if they interacted with customer service and so on and so forth. And so all those things are so key, whereas obviously when you sell through a third party, it, it just becomes a big black box. But for us, um, it's really important for us to be where our customers are. And, you know, in some cases, it is super convenient to purchase your skincare products online. And in other cases, is you really just want to pick up your deodorant or tampons when you are already out of the house and you've realized that you're on like your last tampon and you need it. And I think um, if we're all as prepared as we would like to be, you know, I think sometimes shopping online can be more convenient and other times you just need something then and there. Excellent. I think Nicole might be back. Nicole, yes, can I, I hear you? I'm incredibly sorry about this. Um, I have no idea what's going on, but um, I'm just going to kind of proceed and maybe I'll come in a little later. So I'll just pause after I continue. But thank you so much, Bunny, for already introducing yourself. And then um, Emily, I don't know if you you went, but I um, was going to intro you, but I, I you already went. OK, perfect. Um, so super sorry about that. And today we're kind of going to be talking about um, how to really maximize the customer experience. And I'm going to share a few slides, but really want it to be conversational. So if you guys have questions for Emily and Bunny, who are kind of um, leading edge uh, uh, D2C brands, so we should definitely ask them whatever you want. I think the best um, the best uh, conversation is when you can really have brands speak to it. So um, I'm going to kind of start a little bit of a presentation and then ask them questions throughout. But please don't be shy. I think the more questions, the better. And let me know if you can see my screen. We good to go? Can you guys all see my screen? Yes, good. That's great. Awesome. Um, perfect. So here, again, just some um, faces so you guys have it. Super excited to be joined by you guys. Um, I'm honestly like a little nervous because they're so cool and way cooler than me, but um, excited to hear kind of like their their um, feedback and their um, uh, experience this past year, especially um, from both that are co-founders who have seen exactly what happens um, right at the beginning with startups. Um, so let's kind of dial back to last year. Um, I'm sure, you know, everyone was affected by COVID-19, you know, initially in Gorgeous, um, you know, we saw a drop in tickets from about a, a 33% drop initially in March because everyone's like, what are we doing? And then we saw 2.5x increase after that. And that's grown even more now with 2021. Um, so, you know, a lot of brands had a shift to move online. And, you know, I guess my question for Bunny and Emily is, you know, was this a similar trend that you guys saw? I know, Emily, you're a little bit newer. So curious kind of how you guys navigated the this entire new landscape and, you know, what was kind of a trend that you specifically saw? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we launched in uh, November of last year. So um, it's we really like can't tell you about like the trend in terms of like sales or anything like that. But definitely for a company that's been in prep since 2019, we were actually was about to launch um, with our brick and mortar store in April. Um, so when COVID hit, it was kind of like, you know, like a huge a moment of um, confusion, but I think what really came out of it was a pivot that really um, benefited us, and it was a really blessings in disguise um, because we realized, you know, from transforming from like the brick and mortar retail model to kind of this e-commerce and local delivery model that we're in right now, um, our customers have actually gotten like um, given us like so much great feedback around it. And especially when other um, our competitor refill stores are so brick and mortar based, um, you know, being that like delivery model came in to like a really good advantage for us. Awesome. That's super, super great feedback. And then I guess, Bunny, kind of on your end, you know, what, are, what were some trends that you guys dealt with, some new challenges that you faced? Yeah, I think 
That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think we probably saw a really, really similar kind of drop um, the same way your graph shows. I know like, you know, I think it was like mid-March when um, we were all told to kind of start working from home and staying home more. Um, and I think the most interesting thing was that it was so uncertain. Nobody knew, you know, how long this was gonna be for. Is this for six months? Is this for two months? Um, and I think, for most of us, we didn't really imagine it to have, you know, panned out the way that it did. And so we did see um, a drop in orders for a period. Um, and then we saw things kind of normalize and go back to kind of regular programming. Um, I know from like a CPM perspective um, and some of the paid channels, there is a huge change there too, um, just as like travel companies stopped advertising and CPMs dropped and things like that. So it was definitely um, a volatile few months. Yeah, you us, you and the rest of the world, I mean, I think, you know, one thing to really focus on is being a D2C brand, it kind of gives you a legs up, leg up, because I do, you know, we work with now almost 6,000 customers, and a lot of them were actually just formerly only retail B2B. Um, so already just kind of being ahead of that e-commerce trend, I think is helpful, but again, brings a lot of challenges of its own. And um, kind of what we saw is we saw like a huge increase in support, we saw a huge increase in um, channels just after kind of that March period where people were figuring it out, they were, you know, Shopify had a huge boom. We saw a huge increase from brands. Um, and then a lot of uh, support teams were kind of overwhelmed. And a lot of these support teams were also seeing a lot of uh, repetitive inquiries. So I guess my questions to you, um, so Bunny specifically, you know, what were some things that you saw that were repetitive? And then what did you do to manage all these support um, tickets? And then um, Emily, since you're a little bit newer, just kind of or to the space, kind of understanding how do you plan on dealing with kind of what's what's upcoming? I think the really important thing is customer experience starts from one person to, you know, 10,000 people. I think, you know, anywhere you go, there's customer support. So it's really relevant that we have two different size brands to really talk about kind of the beginning and the end as well. Yeah, I mean, for Bloom, we actually have such an interesting relationship with our customers because quite often, you know, we chat with them or um, have communication with them beyond just, you know, issues with their product or issues with their shipping. Um, and we noticed that definitely over COVID too, where, you know, customers were emailing us with just other concerns about questions that they had, or they were telling us about changes in their lives and how they were shifting to work from home. They're asking us about, you know, what our protocols were, what we were doing to ensure that our staff were staying safe. Um, I think a lot of our customers tend to shop with their wallets and or vote with their wallets. And so they really want to ensure that the companies that they're continuing to support and purchase from have the same values that they have and that um, they also treat their employees correctly. And I think um, what is really interesting is, you know, if we all remember back in like March and April, we we're all sanitizing every package that came in and people were quarantining their packages for a couple of days before they actually started opening them out of fear of, you know, if the virus could live on surfaces or not. And I think um, a lot of those questions were the type that we were getting. And then, you know, just also the general ones where somebody would send an email about where's my package and they would send it you know, three times in one day, just because they're sitting at home, they had more free time, they're waiting for their postman to come, they'd see like their FedEx, FedEx and UPS driver drive by their house and not stop. And they'd be like, I was supposed to get something today. Um, and so we did see that to be really interesting. And I think kind of immediately within those first few months, um, the postal services also started seeing an influx and also um, were having a hard time keeping up. And so because there was such little um, visibility into what was happening with the postal services. Um, we were getting a brunt, uh, we we're getting the brunt of a lot of those inquiries to be like, why hasn't, you know, the tracking updated or why are certain things the way that they are? And um, I mean, even for R3PL, they had to switch to, you know, a whole new system to be COVID compliant. And, and that also, you know, caused some delays and things like that on the shipping side, which we were communicating to our customers. Awesome. Um, I think that's so relevant that you were not only just getting product questions, but you're getting questions about COVID on your product and just like a shift in mindset and how you have to really prepare for that because you have to tell your support team how to answer those questions. And of course, you know, you always want to keep the customer first and tell them, you know, yeah, of course, you know, like you, the product will be fine. You know, if you get it on your doorstep, the doors will be dead. You know, I'm a really interesting challenge for you guys to deal with. And I was definitely one of those people that was messaging, where's my order four times a day because I was sitting at home and so excited. It felt like Christmas every day getting packages and it was like the most exciting part of my day. So um, can totally understand that consumer experience. 
Um, and then, yeah, Emily, I guess, I guess for you, yeah, how, how are you kind of planning, um, you know, around the customer experience? I know you launched no November um, to really, to really optimize on that experience and make sure you're accounting for everything. Yeah. Um, so very similar to Bunny and Bloom, I guess um, we have a very interactive ex um, relationship with our customers. So, you know, coming from kind of this brick and mortar model, that's like very local. We, as we, you know, transferred over to this e-commerce model, we still kind of want to maintain that type of relationship with our customers. So, you know, majority of our interactions right now are just, you know, um, responding to each other's Instagram stories or like, you know, responding to each, each other's comments. So that way that we are really building that kind of trust relationship with our customers. Um, but in terms of kind of like the support side of things, um, because our retail model is so novel um, as of now, in terms of like, you know, what 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 is a refill? That's like one of the biggest questions that we get. And, you know, how does the process work? Um, so with those things, like it was really important to us that rather than just having like a landing page about description, like we wanted to make sure that they have a channel. So, um, to talk to us directly and we can explain it to him with with kind of the personal voice and tone. Um, so those are the things kind of we are planning on and we're actively trying to optimize on. Um, yeah, I think I think brand and tone is so important, um, especially, you know, how to retain your customers is 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 really dealing with them very delicately. And I know you guys have a very interactive experience. Um, but with that there again, as I mentioned, there's a lot of repetitive inquiries. So um, you know, at Gorgeous, we preach a lot about automation and how to really stay personalized while also using um, automation and machine learning to, to do a big lift for those repetitive inquiries. So is that something you guys um, practice or, you know, how how do you guys kind of work around still keeping that delicate um, a customer interaction um, without having to sound robotic, which a lot of people think if you use automation, it's going to be kind of a robotic sense, which isn't true. And I'll kind of give you guys examples after that, but would love to hear from the brands first. And Bunny, you can totally go first, um, I think, because you guys are also heavy users of our platform. Yeah, I mean, I am so grateful for the macros and the automation and the canned responses. Um, pretty much early on in March and, and ever since then, we've just continued to update our canned responses and our macros um, and our tags as needed. Um, and our RCS team will, you know, prepare them and they'll all go through them together based off of either, you know, some inquiries that we anticipate having or um, inquiries that we're seeing kind of repetitively and we're like, okay, let's make sure that we speed this up. So we have a rule at Bloom where if there's any email that we receive more than three times, within like a 24 to 48 hour period, we need to make kind of a macro and an automation and a system around it because chances are that, that you know, if, if we're seeing that inquiry come in, we're gonna continue to see it over time. So that's kind of like one thing that we always live by um, and we have macros and canned responses for everything and we use them, I would say like, we maybe have 5% of tickets that go out that don't involve some type of macro automation or preset up tag. Um, almost all of our inquiries do include these, but um, we are we personalize each one as well. So I don't think we ever send out an email that's just like, you know, the automated canned response. Um, it's always personalized, it's always edited, but it saves us just so much time. And then I think we also have tags set up based off of certain types of inquiries or or just picks up um, what kind of question it is, and then we use those tags to further make more decisions um, from like a data perspective going forward. That's awesome. I think um, one of the most important things that we talk about is, you know, implementing a service or a software um, is actually going to save you so much time and money. So, you know, especially like Emily, if you know you're a small founding team, um, you actually have such limited time to spend on um, certain items. So while customer experience is super important and you should treat it with the utmost care, you also can lean on certain softwares to make sure that it helps you out a lot um, because it saves them a lot of time and money. Um, and Emily, I would love to kind of hear kind of your feedback around that thought. And totally, if you don't agree, that's totally fine. Would just love to just um, understand kind of your point. No, absolutely. Um, I love the macro feature that Gorgeous provided. Um, like you said, as a as a kind of a small founding team that we have, um, you know, we don't have that kind of customer support operational team that could be online twenty four seven. So having something like this um, really saved our time and, um, you know, just like general customer experience. Um, also, another thing that I wanted to really appreciate about Gorgeous was 
um, having that integration with Shopify so that like it really reduces time going back and forth between, you know, the customer looking at customer profiles on different channels and then coming back to this um, CRS system. Um, we also very much integrated Gorgeous into um, Macro to trigger a flow from our email service provider, Clavio. Um, that has also like saved a lot of time for us because, you know, based on the kind of the chat conversations that we have, if we need to like send them into a certain automated flow into email, that was um, just a button click away. So it's definitely um, having that automation group is a must for any small companies like us. Yeah, and I think that exactly how you said, um, capturing that customer data and then having to, you know, trigger in Clavio is again where automation can be super key, whether it's gorgeous, whether it's other platforms. I think they're so intertwined um, that looking into soft, you know, uh, platforms and services like this is going to be super useful for an e-commerce brand that wants to kind of grow in 2021. And um, I love that you kind of touched a little bit about um, I, 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 about um, the omni-channel experience. I think one really important piece is um, with all these different types of customer experience, you uh, you can drive a lot of revenue. Um, so we actually found at Gorgeous that the conversion rate on um, conversations that are responded within 10 minutes, so whether that's SMS, whether that's Instagram chat, um, is 28%. So again, if it's less than 10 minutes, it's going to be a higher conversion rate. And if you think about it and you sit at your desk um, and you're on a website and they don't get back to you within a couple minutes, you've lost that customer. So again, um, just kind of to think about it, or in another term, if you're going to a restaurant and you get really bad service, you're probably not want, gonna wanna go back. Um, I'm definitely one of those people. I always try to give a second chance, um, but I think the same thing goes with um, making sure that they're having such a great experience, trying to target them wherever they are with Clavio and other tools um, to really drive up that conversion rate. And um, again, from both of you, would love to hear if you guys have any best practices there um, or or how you guys have kind of attested to the statement. And if not, no worries, I can just continue talking about it. <laughs> yeah, I can go first. Um, we utilize, I think, the feature of just being online while somebody is available. And so we, we generally try to have like, you know, really set chat times um, so that people know when they can count on us and find us. But if you know, for whatever reason that day we're not able to be online or nobody's able to really um, be available on chat. Um, we always just ensure to be offline so that there's no experience of like, you know, expecting to get a reply. I think people don't often, or people are, are quite used to still going to a website and not seeing live chat and, and not being able to chat with anybody. And I don't think there's really any, um, issues with that from a customer service experience. But I think, like you said, the worst experience is truly when you think that you're going to get a reply and then there's just, you know, crickets and silence and you're like, did they get my message? Get my message? Am I going to get an email back? Do I need to go send an email now? Um, and so we, we use like auto replies whenever possible um, and just try to make it as clear that, you know, we are online and we're here to respond or we are not online right now and send us an email. Love that. I think that's a great best practice. Yeah, I mean, you know, this this stat is, I think, very universal to, you know, any other channels as well. Like, you know, if I get a reply for from an email from some other brands or like a DM reply within five minutes, like I'm automatically just having like the positive like experience with the brand and more likely to just purchase from them. Um, having said that, um, for a small company like us, it it's been very difficult to really like follow that, you know, internal guideline that we had to, to be able to respond to them as quickly as possible. Um, and I would say kind of my learning from this experience so far and to, to the kind of small businesses that are starting out is that don't be hard on yourselves if you can't respond to all the tickets within 10 minutes. I mean, you know, it's, it's not like we can have like entire um, customer service team um, in other countries or, or try to help out. Like that's just not possible for small businesses. Um, and we found that, you know, a lot of customers are really understanding if you're transparent about it and then just letting them know what the context was and, and where you're coming from and um, customers. Yeah. And, and they, they have, we haven't gotten as negative feedback as we expected to have um, from before. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I think you hit a great point. I think there's going to be different benchmarks for the size of the brand that you are, the capacity that you have. Um, and again, I think the more that you can also show empathy, you know, like 
I had a friend, she was having a really bad day. And, um, you know, someone wrote her a really nasty email being like, you know, I expect to get my shipment on time. And she, she's like, she responded and put a huge post on her story and was like, Hey, I'm a one person team. I might seem like a bigger brand, but I'm doing everything by myself. So I'm having a really, you know, sad day hearing this feedback, but also want, you know, you guys to know that, um, this is just me alone in this. And, um, she actually just had the highest sales ever just from that post on her story that day. And she messaged me and she was like, Oh my gosh, being authentic and just being real, um, is so is it, it actually drove sales for me. So, um, again, I think, like you said, for small brands, for larger brands, the more authentic you can be and the more like in your brand tone, you could be, um, that's really what's important. And, and that kind of brings me into like that omni-channel experience I mentioned with stories, um, with Instagram, with Facebook. Um, I think something that we see a lot is, um, again, you can't, can't always be everywhere, but the more channels that you have, uh, the more um, you can kind of attack a new kind of consumer. Um, so I guess for you guys, you know, what are the channels that you guys are active on? Who do you know, uh, or what do you know your consumer uses? And um, which ones would you recommend that are like must, must be, uh, or must use. I know for us, SMS and Facebook Messenger are our top two channels right now. I think people like that conversational tone, really quick responding. And then of course, Instagram DMs, which Gorgeous is rolling out in a month or two here. So stay tuned. Um, but yeah, would love to hear from both of you guys again. Yeah, I think we're probably mm -hmm. on most of the channels. We definitely get the least amount of, I think like DMs or, um inquiries through facebook whereas like we get more like comments on on ads and things on facebook um sms is really really big for us emails huge and instagram dms are probably our biggest um most of our community is definitely on instagram and i think people um tend to use instagram as like all types of communication so not just like i love this or sharing something with us or tagging us in posts but also like customer inquiries and where's my order and something went wrong or I have a question about, you know, what type of product works best for my skin type and, should, you know, if I use this product, can I use this product alongside of it and so on and so forth. And so I think traditionally we would expect all of those kind of inquiries to come through email and majority of them I would say probably still do, but um, both Instagram and SMS are pretty fast um, in creeping up and becoming um, kind of second and thirds in our ways customers communicate with us. And, and do you have any examples of, you know, how, how you engage and you can think on this and we can have come back to it, but you know, an example of a story that really sticks with you from like a customer experience standpoint on any of the channels? Um, I think one thing that kind of stands out and it's not necessarily a specific experience, but it happens often is that customers want to tell us about things in their life um, just because they want to chat. And I think going back to authenticity and really being honest and true to our customers um, is it, it comes down to that. Like they'll tell us that they need to change, you know, their delivery address because they broke up with their boyfriend or that they need to um, cancel their subscription because they're pregnant. And so we really um, have that open and honest communication with our customers. And whenever possible, we try to then surprise and delight them based off of the information that they told us. So, you know, if they're moving houses, maybe we'll send them a bouquet of flowers or if they're, um, you know, sometimes they'll go on like a new type of hormonal acne pill, which means that they can't use any topicals and we'll try to gift them something to make that transition easier. So there's all these little things that we learn about our customers that help us make more informed decisions, but also allow us to build that rapport and really just treat our customers um, like our friends. Because at the end of the day, I think that um, many of them are um, with our CS team, especially they've gotten um, so close to so many of our customers. And I think it's just really interesting and cool that not only do they, you know, ask us like, oh, can I use Meltdown with Retinol? They'll also tell us um, a little bit about their skincare journey and their history and how they got to where they are, where they found Bloom or um, how, you know, maybe if they heard about Bloom from a friend, how um, the products impacted their friend and what made them purchase. And so I think like the extent of open communication we have with our customers, honestly, sometimes it surprises me because I'm like, wow, I would have never thought that we'd be having this much of an open conversation, but it's so heartwarming and so wholesome and, and just so incredible. Wow, that's that's really awesome. Um, you actually already totally answered my next point that I was gonna bring up, is like how to really turn your customer experience around. Um, and I think you guys do it so well. I think even how you just mentioned, you know, surprising and surprising delight is, is super key. 
and again, keeping that level of authenticity. And Emily, um, do you have anything specific to share about kind of like the omni-channel experience or a customer um, a, a interaction that stood out to you? Um, uh, we we have a very similar um, relationship, like I said before. How how I think Bunny's story is so adorable, and um, it's something mm -hmm. that you know we we definitely want to expand on as well. Um, for a space that we're in, which is the sustainability, we actually have um, a really strong bonded community of zero waste slash low waste group of people. Um, and when they interact with us, it's not just about like. Uh, specifically our product or operations um, but you know they just love sharing like other tips that they would um, want us to post maybe um, as a content marketing on our Instagram um, they ask for or some type of like substitute sustainable substitute from what they're using right now and stuff like that so that kind of relationship building is you know happen mostly on Instagram just because of our content marketing, but it definitely transferred into like our email or live chat or or even texting whenever we do our local delivery. Um, it's it's just like, you know, really building that trusting relationship with them. So, you know, when they have some, some type of complaints or negative feedback, um, you know, and we can we can be transparent and they they are less likely to to be just, you know, be an upset customer that just leaves, right? Um, they, they know that, that they value the relationship with us and we would love, we'd like to continue that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think going along with everything you both have said, um, you know, the, you can acquire new customers through like just Facebook, Instagram comments. So as you can kind of see here by these examples, which I haven't touched on yet is Megan tags her friend with hard emojis. You know, that's a qualified lead for you. Maybe they're already a customer and gorgeous. You can actually see if they are a Shopify customer. Um, and then what you can do is you can uh, tag both of them and offer them 10% off. So now you've created a great customer experience for not only Megan, but also Jessica. Um, and again, you know, if, if, if you have, um, you know, someone asking a question, if I buy, can I return it? Uh, what you can do is you can also sign it off with PS. We have an awesome Black Friday promo code. So again, upselling, getting your offers out, surprising them and delighting them with those promo codes and just, um, across all different channels is super key to the customer experience. Um, and again, you can track sales, as I mentioned, um, that conversion rate um, within this if you have a lower response time. I think that's the goal for everyone is to have a lower response time. But like I said, it's totally different benchmark depending on the size of your brand. Um, and I think that kind of wraps up, you know, most of the touch points about, um, can you guys, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, most of the kind of main points about, uh, you know, the customer experience, is there any key takeaways that you would kind of give to people that are building a brand right now in 2021 of non-negotiable, like one piece of advice? Um, I'd say look at every piece of negative feedback as an opportunity to improve. Um, it can be painful and it's difficult. And like, sometimes it's totally okay to feel like the negative feedback is unwarranted um, or, you know, maybe, maybe you don't agree with it, but at the end of the day, every customer is a gift and every piece of negative feedback is as much of a gift as positive feedback is. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, you don't need to act on every single one, but pay attention to, um, Pay attention to them because they're all opportunities to improve. Love um, it. And I definitely agree to that, especially um, as a early stage startup, these kind of type of like feedback loop is really important to us. And having, you know, a uh, personal relationship is also really, really important. I find that, you know, as we all these like kind of e-commerce brands are starting up, like what we have different from this, like, you know, gigantic, say, Amazon brands or like other products that are there, what we have is that personal relationship. And I think that's something to keep in mind um, as you build a brand. Awesome. I love it. And for me, it's just look, look at ways you can make your life easier, work hard, work smarter, not harder. Um, so again, with whether it's with a tool. Um, Chloe, do we have time for the one question or are we wrapping up? We're probably going to have to wrap up. Okay, no worries. I'll respond the 10. The question is um, is on YouTube, so if, if any of you fancy nepping over there and answering the question afterwards, I know that would be greatly appreciated by the person who asked it. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, so those of you not watching on YouTube, there you go, intrigue, intrigue thing. Um, 
Nicole, uh, we've got the gorgeous link going across the screen there. Was there anything else you want to say about how people can get in contact with you uh, before we say goodbye to all three of you? Um, I think we're good. Emily and Bunny, if you guys want to leave your emails or a promo code that you guys want to do, um, I wasn't sure if you wanted to include it there. You guys can kind of comment it in um, really quickly. But other than that, you know, thank you guys for joining me and thank you, Ecom Tech, for having us. It's been an, it's been, it's been an sorry, Derek. He's going, Chloe, your audio is weak. That would be because my mic's on my head. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Amateur mistake there. I mean, call myself a podcaster. Thanks for letting me know, Derek. Um, so, Nicole, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Bunny, Emily, thanks for sharing so much of your experience. I know it will have helped people. Um, we will say goodbye to the three of you guys right now. And if you've got anything you want us to, to chat out to the audience, just put it in the chat and I'll make sure it gets to them shortly. Um, now, 